<laughs> Welcome to tonight's <laughs> live, Mr. Jerry. How you doing, my friend? Good, good, good. Cody, great to be here again. I look forward to these every single week. This is like so fun to do with you. I really appreciate it. Dude, likewise, I sit there and, and this is the one that my my wife's like, oh, Jerry and just a good dude. He's like, like normally it's like five o'clock at night. That's my time to be at home with the family. Yeah. She's like, oh, you guys go have fun. It looks like you guys have a riot. I'm like, oh, <laughs> Jerry's a good dude. So, all yeah, right. Well, we great. To awesome topics to talk about too. Ooh, yes. In fact, I'm going to bring on our guest right now. His name is Brian Hemmerly from Kentucky. Whoa. Hey, what's up, guys? Thanks you for having me on. You are live with us. And uh, let me see if I can get a better screen here. Does that look better like that? Yeah, it looks better. I think it does. Okay. Let's do this one. So, uh, yeah, guys, we're excited. While we break down some deals, um, we're going to be doing a just a live case study. The whole point behind these my hope is that whether you're old school like me and you have a pad of paper and a pen or whether you're digital and you want to write your notes in there but the whole point is jerry and i are doing this so that you can literally get some gold nuggets from these and start acting upon them in fact the people that are going to be doing deals are the ones that took action they're not the ones that took massive preparation or <laughs> massive preparedness or built a perfect plan it's just the ones that just get out of their own way with a little bit of instruction, take action, and then come back and make an adjustment and go out and take more action. So tonight's big old reminder, tonight is the night that we all take action, that we all make those little shifts. We all make those little tweaks that we need to do to get out of our own way and do more deals. And so we're going to have uh, Brian here going over this. He's going to be breaking down a deal on how he got creative with it. Um, but Jerry, anything you want to uh, start off with the audience or anything that you want to remind Yeah, you? Yeah. So guys, really what Cody and I look at each week when we put together one of these live streams here is we want your participation. So go ahead and chime in on the chat. Let us know you're there. Cody's does a great job of, uh, of bringing some of your comments up on the screen so that you can kind of participate with us live. We're going to try to make time to answer questions as well on this live stream. But the big thing about what's so important about what we're doing here is we're, we're going to deep dive on specific things. So this week, we're going to be really focusing on creative ways to wholesale deals. Now, it's not necessarily creative financing, which we could talk about, and that certainly kind of falls into that bucket or that umbrella. But more importantly, what we want to really talk about is the, the we and we, we touched on this last week too, Cody, but really, you don't want to be a one-trick pony in this business. You don't want to just have such a narrow minded view of how to do deals that uh, you can only do a deal if it falls under certain parameters. You've got to start to expand the way that you see the business, the way that you look at deals, because the more creative you can be, the more willing you are to think outside the box, then the bigger deals you're going to be able to do, the bigger spreads you're going to be able to do. And you're really going to be able to expand into multiple ways to make money in this business. And at the end of the day, guys, I don't want to identify myself as a wholesaler or a fix and flipper or a buy and hold or a whatever. I want to identify myself as a real estate investor. And that means I'm able to capitalize. I'm able to recognize and capitalize on, on opportunities in the marketplace as they present themselves and really make the highest return on deals given the time, energy, and effort it takes to do those deals. So if we can start to really look at the business without those blinders on, you'll be amazed at just what's going on around you. And in a lot of cases, you're presented with these situations where I see a lot of wholesalers kind of walk from the deal like, oh, you know what? That's kind of outside of my, my small box. And so I'm out, you know, I, gotta, I can't put that deal together. So I'm done and they move on. Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna be talking with Brian here about how he put this deal together and it was all these unique things going on for it to work out. And it ended up becoming an awesome deal. So I just want to add that kind of to this before we get going, Cody. Solid, solid. So Brian, give us a little background. We've got a lot of people chiming in from all across this great nation. Um, I even saw an aloha from Hawaii. Uh, nice. We will be there in March, by the way. Super excited. We hope that restrictions allow my family in. Let's go. 
Uh, okay, so give us a background, Brian. Tell well, us cool. First, about first of all, thanks for uh, thanks for both of you guys for having me on. It's an honor to be on here. I appreciate. Uh, I would have never guessed two years ago before I got into this uh, crazy business, fun business of wholesaling, that I'd be on a podcast with two very successful uh, uh, real estate investors. But you know, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. I started wholesaling um, probably back in June of 18, but uh, full time within the last six seven months. I left in June. And uh, we're doing on average depends, you know, three to four deals uh, a month, hoping to get that to five to six or more uh, here here in 20, uh, uh, 21. Love it. Love it. So what got you into wholesaling? What was it? What made you think, man, I've been doing X amount of years at a W2 job. You loved it. You didn't necessarily hate it. What got you into wholesaling? Why did you want to switch at, at the stage of life you're in? What made you want to get into it? Well, well, back in 18, I, I remember getting a postcard in the mail. I'm like, why in the world am I getting a postcard for my one of my <laughs> rental properties? I had not a lot. I think I have th three or four at the time. And I just didn't understand. So I, I did some research on the company. I actually called the owner up, had lunch and meeting with her. And she told me about what wholesaling was. <laughs> and uh, I was like, really? I, well, I've been in sales my whole life. Like, I like to talk to people, like marketing. And uh that's about the same time I probably found the Wholesaling Inc. podcast at the time. And I was just like, hmm, hmm, I can do this. So you're telling me I can source my own deals, which what Jerry was talking about, being able to source your own deals. And then now I've got multiple exit strategies to do with it. I can wholesale it. I can hotel it, take it down. I can burr it, which we're doing. We have three burrs currently going on. Break or it down for those that might be listening. They're like, burr, what the heck is burr? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. It's yeah. not just in the winter months when you're cold. <laughs> So you buy it, you rehab it, um, you refinance, I'm sorry, you rent it, you refinance and you repeat. So I think uh, my partner, Josh, I've got to give a big shout out, Josh Hardy. Uh, you met him back in January. Um, yeah. Man, he's been a blessing for me and, and our business. And we're we're working together to, to grow this thing. But yeah, so we're, we're I think we've had five burrs this winter uh, or this this past six to seven months from our deals. Yeah. Sort of our deals. And we bought one from another uh, person who wholesales too, but Anyhow, so the point is, I had no idea about the wholesaling at all, and now it's changed my life. I left the corporate world, you know, having someone to tell me what I have to do. I've got a quota here. And now I'm, you know, trying to learn and grow, and manage people, and try to still do sales, and just try to handle all the pieces. Um, so that's a big, a big uh, learning curve for me. That's awesome. That's awesome, guys. We're going to be breaking down this wholesaling term, and don't get it too hard to understand. And all it is just simply being good at finding deeply discounted properties. If you can just keep it to that and that simple definition, the exit strategies are so endless. And so I think so many people think wholesaling is just the assignment. It's just the assignment. And, and I think, yes, the assignment is an exit strategy, but really it's just the art of finding your own deals at a deep discount. And that's the beauty of knowing the wholesale game is how do I find these off market? How do I find my own deals? So then I can pick the right strategy, the right exit strategy to capitalize the way I need to, whether that is buy and hold or do the burr or whether it's to just simply assign to a cash buyer. Um, we, we kind of just, we, every deal, we were able to really look at multiple different exit strategies. We fix and flip, we do burr, we do uh, assignments and we just find out what's the best one. And I'll, I'll share one here in a little bit. Once we get going, I was just talking to Jerry about this hotel deal we just did. And I'm excited to share with you guys. So let's get rocking and rolling. Um, we're going to be breaking down a deal right now. So get ready. This is where we break this down. And as we do guys, if we can hone in your questions, to be as granular and specific to this topic right here. There's going to be so many questions that we're, we're going to try and bring as many on as we possibly can, but we also want to make sure that they're really tied into tonight, tied into what's going on. Uh, be specific. If you want to know what marketing list or how we found the marketing list or how we marketed to them, those are great questions. There's going to be some questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but we'll get to as many as possible but ultimately, uh, let's get going. So Jerry, I don't know if you want to start this off with any questions on how to get going with uh, his deal or if you want me to go. Yeah, so Brian's got this lead and, and Brian, what we're going to do is we're going to ask you to kind of break it down for us. Again, guys, this is going to be a creative way that Brian put this deal together. And we want to, as we go through this, we want to kind of dissect it a bit. So, so Brian, why don't you start out and share with us, uh, first of all, how you identified that lead, what marketing channel did you use for that lead to come in the front door? 
Yeah. So <clears throat> the lead we're, lead we're going to talk about today was uh, a driving for dollars lead. And uh, of course, we send majority of our marketing is is direct mail or has been direct mail. Uh, we're going to some other directions as well, but it was a driving for dollars lead. And so they called. Uh, I use Call Rail, uh, so they called in, and left me a voicemail. I called them back. Uh, I always I learned a long time ago, like you, you got to call those people back right away. I could tell a little bit of motivation on the phone, so I had a conversation with them, set up an appointment. Um, Fairly what quickly. Kind of, what gave you the sense that there was motivation? What does motivation sound like to kind of help people out? I mean, you, it's kind of like their voice. If they're leaving you a lot of information, hey, you know, I've, I've got a property here, 123 Main Street, call me back, ASA, you know, or call me back at this phone number here. Um, and you just try to get back to them. Awesome. Okay. So you go out, you try to set this appointment. Is that, what does that look like? Break that down because I want people to understand. Is this something that you're like, oh, it sounds okay. And so I think it's Monday now and I think it's going to be great to go out there Friday. I mean, how do you handle this? Is this something that's like, man, if I hear motivation, I'm trying to get there as quick as possible. Is there strategy behind setting the appointment? Oh, if, if there's motivation, right? If they, you know, Any type of motivation, you want to set that appointment ASAP and go meet with them. And now, Brian, I got a question. So you mentioned both driving for dollars and direct mail. How did those two coincide with each other on this lead? Yeah, good question. So we had we had a driver who would go and pin properties. And then what we do is every Monday, my VA takes those driving for dollars leads and he would upload them uh, into, we use what's called Investor Hub. He mm -hmm. would upload that system there and then it goes out for the, the following week uh, mail. For mail. Right. And how and many times do you mail? Um, on average, we'll, we'll mail, I think, three times. To, to each lead. Yeah. Now, when they do the D for D, do they knock the door or just gather the address? Oh, they just gather the address using, okay. I'm sorry, using deal, the deal machine app. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I guess I'm used to, I'm used to a lot of the stuff. So for all the viewers out there, yeah. So deal machine is great. We use that. So we pinned it. And the cool thing about this lead is they weren't on any other list. Mm -hmm. And honestly, their house wasn't that bad. I'm like, man, I'm glad he actually pinned this house. Because yeah, it wasn't like, this is like horrible, but it was, you know, the point of it is, is, you know, you're getting a list. He may have not gotten a lot of postcards from other people because he wasn't on another list. So that's the beauty yeah. of driving for dollars, right? So, but you um, mentioned, you mentioned that, um, you didn't specifically drive for dollars. Who did that? Uh, it was a, it was actually a, a coworker of mine, a driver. He, he's willing to drive for me, um, to pin properties. And how do you, what's your structure with him to do driving for you? Uh, that's another story, but I'm, I'm probably paying it too much, but at the end of the day, like, uh, um, it, it's, it's worked out. I've paid him on several deals. Um, so commission based. Yeah. I gave him a percentage. Okay. So, so guys, uh, I want to kind of stop right there, Brian, if it's okay. And, and, and make a couple observations here. So when you think about marketing channels, right. There's multiple ways that you can work a lead. And, and the, way, the one thing I like to look at with leads is the more times you touch a lead, the more, the more chances you increase that you're going to get somewhere, right? You're going to convert that lead. And so what your method was, was it was you sent someone to drive for dollars on a commission structure. They, they wrote down addresses of distressed properties. I'm guessing vacant, dilapidated or neglected, right? And then that goes on a list. That list then gets mailed. Um, you could take it a step further and skip trace cold call those leads as well, probably. But the idea here is that you're going to try to get in front of that seller by creating an inbound through a direct mail marketing strategy. Um, guys, I put out a video here, I don't know, a few months back, which was uh, basically talking about why driving for dollars is bad. Now, let me clarify that. It's not bad. The point I made in the video was it's not a good way to leverage your time. So if you're personally driving for dollars, it's not like that's a bad idea other than you're only accomplishing what you and you alone can do in a given amount of time. So if you spend four hours driving for dollars, whatever you accomplish in that four hours, it's, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. What Brian's doing is he's building a team now. He's implementing people. He's leveraging himself by getting other people to do the driving for dollars. He's figuring out some kind of payment structure for those people. But think about it. He could have 20 drivers now yeah. and he still has his Sunday afternoon free. 
and he's got other people doing all of the heavy lifting. That's the point that I think we should really clarify when it comes to driving for dollars is if you're doing it yourself, just know that you're, you're not, you're not leveraging at all your capacity. So true. Brian, would you agree with that? Oh yeah. hundred percent. You know, if I was out driving all day, you know, day long, you know, I would, I would never be able to grow a business. Right. And I want to grow a business with team members that can, I can leverage their talents. And, and if, when I'm finding out these guys are a lot better, I'm not very good at a lot of stuff. And you find people, <laughs> and you find people who are good at it and, and have them put the processes in place and, and have them do those things that, you know, quite frankly, that you're not good at or that can help, you know, at least for me, focus on things I think that I'm best at for now until I can find people that are better than me. I love it. Yeah, I'll give you a quick, ex I'll give you a quick example of that. Uh, so in here in Phoenix, I do, I do some really high luxury new construction. And I talked to a bird dog who said, Jerry, I'm willing to knock doors. And I said, okay, well, here's my boundaries of where I'm looking. I need a north, south facing lot, one acre. I gave him my parameters, right? And he went and knocked doors and I basically said to him, here's the price I'll pay for this type of lot that I can build on. He went and did it, ended up finding me a deal that met, you know, the criteria. I paid him a 40,000. He, he made a $40,000 assignment fee because he was willing to go do what other people weren't willing to do. And it worked great for me because I'm leveraged now. I'm not knocking doors. I got somebody else knocking doors. And so same concept. Think about ways you can do the same things you're already doing, but leverage other people and a commission structure is the best way to do it because there's no overhead. It doesn't cost you anything unless they get a deal. So that's a great way to think about, you know, a lot of this is, is a commission-based structure. Awesome. Tell me this, Brian, on that. Did the owner live in the house or was it vacant? Yeah, the owners actually lived in the house. Okay. They, they lived in the house. Do you want me to go into the details of the, of the conversation? Yeah, I, I think what's crucial is to help people. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. This is what's going to be good. So what did it sound like? You're, you're setting the appointment. What does this all sound like? Are you talking about on the phone specifically? Yeah, and then yes. And then when you went out there, what did it, how did yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, going? I've got a script that I go through. I mean, not that I use the script. I'm kind of used to having conversations with people, set an appointment so the motivation if you go out there and meet with them, set the expectations like, hey, that, you know, I buy houses. We're coming out and having a conversation. You know, if we're, you know, if we're going to be a fit for you, you know, we want to be able to move forward, you know, pretty quickly on it. See, you know, see if we can help you. Um, so I went out and had a conversation. And of course, it's owner occupied. And their main goal was they were actually building a, uh, a modular home on a big piece of land. And they wanted to be able, they had some time. And the modular home, I think, was delayed for about two or three months. So they wanted to be able to sell their house, but live in their house. Um I try to give them, I always try to give people other options than working with me. Like I always, yeah. listen, I'm not going to probably be your best fit. And I say that over and over again. Why don't you just list it with a real estate agent? Like you can probably get your top dollar that way. You know, are you what sure? Why don't you just keep it as a rental? Why don't you just keep it as a rental? I mean, it's a nice home you got here. Like keep it as a rental. The yeah, takeaway. Wait till your module home is built. Yeah. You know? Well, no, we, we'd actually prefer for, for us to, you know, why this module home is being built, actually have our cash. So we could use part of that cash for the down payment of the lot or some, some piece of that. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. And, you know, I always, I look at this business as, as trying to solve problems. And I think a lot of people, and I, I'm not calling out all realtors, but a lot of them, do, all they think about is price. They don't think about really how they can solve that person's problem. And I think that's a big part of this business. And I think a lot of people miss that. And of course, I'm always trying to get better at, at understanding people's situations and their problems. But at the end of the day, that's what it is. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Brian, if I can comment on that. So, so guys, you guys listening here, I hope you caught what he said. He, he'll say to a seller, look, why don't you go on market with a real estate agent? You'll probably get more money than what I can give you. Or why don't you keep this as a rent? So what you're doing is you're saying, look, there's you have all these other options. I can come in and I can solve a serious problem, but I'm you need to chase me right now. Like, well, I'm going to set up a relationship with you where – you need me, I don't need you. And what that does is it, it lowers the guard now. You come across now not like a motivated buyer and it lets the seller then just kind of take their guard down. It lets them open up. You start to identify what the real issues are. And since you're focusing on problem solving, you're gonna offer a solution now that's gonna be unique to their situation. Whereas any type of retail buyer is not gonna be able to do, a real estate agent's not gonna be able to do, probably conventional financing's not gonna be able to do. 
And because of that, you're able to then get, get a, a really great discount because you're solving problems that nobody else can solve. And that's, that's, what we're, that's what we do as wholesalers. We solve problems that other people can't solve. Brian, one of these things though you're talking about is you've got, uh, you've got a guy that wants to live in a house longer. And I think what happens is many times we get scared. We get scared maybe being new in the business. Jerry, you started this so well by saying it's crucial over the time that you're in here. What got us here does not get us there. Mm -hmm. Meaning if we really want to grow this and expand this, yes, you've got to start bringing on new creative thinking, new new ways of exiting the property and not always just keep it the same way where you just put a home under contract, assign it. Put a home under contract, assign it. Because on a deal like this, it may not work as simple as just put a home under contract and assign it. When you have someone that wants to live in it now for the next little bit and that you're closing on it ahead of time, now it's like, how do we get creative? A lot of people would run away like, oh, that's not going to work. A cash buyer is not going to want that. They're not going to want to do this because someone's going to want to live in there. And then they're going to have to figure out how to evict them if they don't move out. And you start overcomplicating this. But how were you able to structure a deal and fulfill? I mean, was this something that you put under contract and closed right away? Or did you give them money up front, but closing was held out till a later date? What did that look like so that you could make that, that what was a problem for them guys? Listen, how cool this is. This is why Brian's getting a discount. He's creating a solution. And for doing so, people are willing to sacrifice price on how much they get for their home because Brian is a solution to the bigger problem and it's not the price. They don't want to have, they want to be able to sell it. So they're, they're like, Ooh, at least that's done. And I have some cash to go buy a, my lot, but we need to live here too. So how did you structure this together? How did you put this all in paper? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, of course we came to an agreement. I put a contract in place and uh, I actually didn't take the place down. I just assigned it. I assigned most of our deals to, to our cash buyers. Every once in a while I'll do what's called a double close. But in this instance, I, I just assigned it. Um, and when I, you know, when I'm talking to, uh, you know, a homeowner who's it's owner occupied, I just, I'm just real upfront. I'm just like, listen, you know, in, in a couple of days, we need to schedule a walkthrough inspection. There's going to be a boatload of people, a boatload. I'm just letting you know right now, there could be 20, 30, 40 people walking through your house. Are you going to be okay with that? They're going to be our contractors, potential partners, funding partners. I've got a lot of investor friends that probably want to come and check out the property too. Mm -hmm. And Dude, I love it. They're like, and a lot of people think that's scary. Why I'm do you like, do this? Oh, oh, when I first started, you, you better believe it, right? <laughs> well, my, mental, my mentality is, is like, listen, when I put something on a contract, I'm buying it. It's something we're, we're getting it done, right? So that's the, the confidence you have to have. Uh, and I built that over time. If, if this would have been my first deal, I probably would have been scared and maybe walked away. Um, yeah. But I've learned over, over the last couple of years that, you know, if it's a, if it's a deal and it was a deal, I knew it was a deal, right? And, and of course, when I go to send that out to my cash buyers, I got a huge list of cash buyers. I just notate it out. Listen, you will inherit the property probably for two or three months. Um, it's a great deal. It's going to be a great cash flowing uh, rental for this person. And I felt that the the owners were were solid um, were solid people, right? And I knew that they weren't going to you know have any issues with evictions or anything like that. So I just, I just gave some advice to the person who was buying it. I mean, just make sure you're putting in a short-term lease. Uh, make sure you're covered. You know, I handed her my attorney um, so we could put something together for her. So I was helping that end buyer as well. Who's, she was somewhat new, but not really that new. But I don't think she had a lot of rentals. Um, so just kind of guiding her on that piece. Um, and it was easy peasy. So, so Brian, let's talk about a little bit here, this structure. And you guys listening right now, when there's an owner occupying the property, the when, when that happens to me, when I'm talking to a lead and the owner's living in the home, it's an owner occupied home. The first question I ask that seller is, what do you plan to do when you sell this property? Where do you plan on going? Because you may need to solve that problem for that person. If, if they don't have a place to go, that might be an issue. Um, maybe where they're going isn't quite ready, like in Brian's case. You really need to understand that about your seller so that if there's an issue there that needs solved, you can help solve that problem. So in this case with Brian's guy, they, they wanted to sell, but they, they weren't quite ready for the new place they were going to. So we do what's called a seller rent back agreement. In fact, I'll give you guys that for free. I've got a download link that gives that form for free. 
I would say on my deals right now, we run into that about 10 to 20% of the time where the seller wants to stay in the house for some kind of extended period of time. A lot of times what it is, is they need the proceeds from the sale before they can pay for packing and moving before they can pay for uh, a deposit and first month's rent on a new apartment or a down payment on another house. So a lot of times if you give a seller, let's say a 30 day uh, occupancy. Now to do that, there's some things you got to follow, right? I, I get a deposit held back in escrow and I make them pay rent for that time that they're staying in the property. And this is all easy to put together. And when you put that together and you take that to your cash buyer, as long as the cash buyer understands what they're getting in the contract with that seller, then it's fine because they know that they've got to deal with those things too. And ultimately they just want the property. They'll pick up that cash flow, you know, for a month or two months or whatever it is. And so it's just a creative way that you've got to be looking at these deals. And again, it all comes back to that question, Mr. Seller, Mrs. Seller, what do you plan on doing when we buy your property? And then that helps you identify if you're going to need to work with them and help them in some kind of way. Phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Phenomenal. So okay. these people, Brian, they wanted to stay for how long in the property? They were unsure. It was at least probably a couple months. Okay. And so the way you structured it was we're going to buy the property. Like this is your contract, right? We're, there's going to be a closing date. There's a price agreed upon. And then in addition to that, there's going to be a lease agreement for them to lease the property, correct? Yeah. So at, you know, at closing or a little bit, uh, the day before, I think the, the buyer had the uh, uh, lease signed, uh, rent for that prorated amount for the, I think for the first month. And then I believe a security deposit too. Yeah. To protect themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So guys, I've got one right now. That's the identical situation. The seller wants 45 days. So I agreed to a 45 day rent back. I'm holding back 15,000 in escrow. Now, why 15,000? I hope you know the answer. I want him highly motivated to get the heck out of there. And I don't want to squatter. I don't want an eviction. I don't want to deal with him. So 15,000 out of his proceeds is enough to keep them really motivated to get out of there. And we worked out a proration of like 66 bucks. It comes to three grand for the 45 day window. And then there's a penalty if he's still there after 45 days. So that's all easy. It's easy. You put it in your contract. Now, when I go to sign that deal, if, if I assign that deal, then that cash buyer just has to understand those, those terms I agreed to. And then they step in and we're done. Right? So it's just, it's just a couple more clauses in your contract that cover that situation. Um, but remember, you're always thinking about your cash buyer. If you if you set up a structure, make sure it's a good structure that a cash buyer is going to want to is going to want to agree to that. If you put a bad deal together, it's going to shoot yourself in the foot because the cash buyer is going to go, wait a minute, I don't want that deal. That's a bad deal, right? right. So, you know, love it, uh, Brian. I want to hear the easiest answer on this. I'm setting you up for a, oh, for a home run right here. <laughs> My issue right now is comping properties. What is the easiest way, Brian, when it comes to comping? Is it about the numbers? Is it about the MLS? Or what is the secret sauce to just be in and out in one minute or less? Oh, you're talking about, you know, so you can use um, you can use Zillow, PropStream, and just try to kind of find like properties. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, but ultimately, does it really matter? Does like, it really matter? Like, I tell people, quit, quit. People call me all the time, ask for advice, like, Quit worrying about the cops and all that stuff. You got to understand their problem, their situation. If that if that's a deal, it's a deal, and you'll figure it out. But yeah, yeah. And I think the biggest secret on that, the biggest secret is just get it as low as possible. That's the best part. Like that's the secret. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds like oh come on, there's more to it, guys. I'm telling you, if you're spending more than two minutes comping a property, you're spending way too many minutes. Like those are wasted minutes. It is literally just getting a ballpark of, oh, okay, the area is right around 250,000. It's not getting specific. It's not getting any more granular than that. And then you just go out on the appointment and get it as low as possible. And really that's the secret when it comes to wholesaling. You don't need to know the just because you can get three licensed appraisers out there and you're going to get three different prices back. And these guys are licensed individuals. So price is subjective and you just got to go out there and just get it as low as possible. Okay, so oh, you're over there talking to this individual. You structure this deal. Ultimately, what were you able to put it under contract for? 
Uh, we put this uh, under for a hundred. You put under contract for a hundred, and then from there, how many cash buyers to give people like a a good, like solid base of what they need to do? Why? What? How many cash buyers on your list, and why do you have at least that much on there? I believe we're we're approaching close to thirty six hundred right now. Okay. Um, and that was gotten through a variety of strategies, calling, just grit and grind, and sharing sharing list. Um, you you name it, pulling pulling all these buyers from everywhere. And is that um, a final number, or is that always an ongoing growth? Oh, number? It's, that's a big that's a big push in twenty twenty one. Is just always to find additional you know additional buyers that we can network with, that we can connect with, that we can you know add value to them as well. Um, yeah. Why is that I, crucial to you? Why is that crucial to be part of your game plan to always have the, a bigger cash buyers list? More people with eyes on opportunities when they see our deals uh, and how we and how we disposition most of the deals. I mean, obviously, the more eyes on it, the better the better you know chance we're going to have of of signing that or you know selling that contract to another uh, in buyer. That's exactly right, uh, Jerry. On just a perspective on even our Utah market, and then you can kind of talk about just in general, some of your stuff is we have over 9,000 now cash buyers wow. in our Utah market. And the, and we're always growing this. We now have a full-time VA that just does this for us. Mm -hmm. But the, the beauty behind this is I don't want to see, I know it sounds crazy, but only cash buyers are going to be offended by this comment. I don't want to see repeat buyers. Like I don't. That means I'm not doing it right. That means I'm not maximizing how much I can make on each deal. And that really is my goal, guys. It's 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 how do I make as much money as possible on each deal, and still that the buyer that buys it that he is good with it. He he knows he's buying it at that price, and he's going to do and do his thing and make money too. That's that's all part of it. But there's a lot that gets into this operation. Brian Hemmerly is now growing his business and getting a team in place. There's cost of employees. There's cost of just. If there's office space for us, I'm in 3,000 square feet of office space. I've got 50 grand a month going out in marketing. Like, yes, of course, this is for profit. And so I love what you're sharing is that 3,600 cash buyers. Guys, I didn't have 3,600 cash buyers until probably our fourth year. And then we just like threw gas on it and turned it up to, to get to where we're at quick. Um, but I'll tell you, it's it's crucial. The more eyes you have on your properties, the higher chance you have of making of getting someone to a want it, but b making more money per deal. And if you're if you're seeing that majority of your deals are repeat buyers, repeat buyers, and then you try to justify it and tell yourself like, oh man, I have my VIP list. That's called a cash buyer's employee. You now work for them, and you're just getting minimum pay on this. You're not maximizing how much you make, and don't let them justify or tell you or convince you that you shouldn't make as much money as possible. This is your business. This is your livelihood. And what you get to do with that money becomes a tool to bless other people's lives. So heck yes, I want to make a ton of it. Um, so always grow that cash buyers list. That's crucial. Jerry? Great point. Yeah, so so I love that, Cody. And, and guys, uh, so what Cody's talking about here is the long play in the business, which is, first of all, don't get in this business if you're not in it for the long haul because you build momentum as you go along. So, so Cody's you know, in how long has it been, Cody? Five years since you started wholesaling? Yeah, May of 15. So May this year is six. May of this year is six years. And so you've been working consistently every single day. Now you're putting even more energy into growing that cash buyer list. So guys, that should be for everybody a never ending activity that you do is growing your list, right? If you're serious about wholesaling. Uh, I also do fix and flip, so I have the same attitude about funding, right? I'm always raising more money and cheaper money around the clock, every day, all the time. I'm never happy with as much money as I have because I can always get cheaper money. So the idea here is I'm going to continually build and grow my business. Clearly, the bigger the cash buyer list you have, when you put a lead, when you put a deal out to that list, your, your hope is that there's a unique situation with one of those buyers where they're going to pay a premium. They want that property for some unique reason. More than likely, I bet you, Cody, they're going to come out of formula, you know, and they're going to overpay because of some situation that's going on where they just really want that deal. It may not even make sense. Like, why are you paying that much for that deal? Right. It doesn't even pencil, but they want it for whatever reason. And so that's the idea. The more eyeballs on your deal, the, 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 the better chance of getting the best number you possibly can. 
right? Same idea when you wholetail, right? You take it down, put it back up on the MLS, you're getting a ton more eyeballs on your deal, which means you're gonna get a higher price. Having said that, I know a lot of people listening right now, you're brand new. Maybe your list is really tiny or maybe you have no list at all. So the, the misconception or the fear that I have when you hear, you know, build a massive list is you think because I don't have a list, now I'm limited on being able to do the business. And that's where that's just not true. You can find a cash buyer, a, you know, one for your deal and wholesale that deal and make 10, 15, 20,000, whatever, and get your deal done. So never let the size of your list prevent you or limit your ability to do this business. Build as you go. Every time you get a deal, do whatever you've got to do to find a buyer, right? And over time, you're going to start to build a massive list. And a day will come where you're a Cody Hoffine and you push a button on your email and you've got 10 people raising their hand and Cody's saying, just invest, just do tomorrow, and somebody pays ten grand more than you asked for the deal, right? Like that's your dream to get to, and it just starts today. It starts tomorrow. It starts every day working on your business. Next thing you know, six years later, nine thousand cash buyer lists. Okay, that's how cool this is. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. A lot of good points there, Jerry. I'd love to pick your brain about. Uh uh, finding it, uh, private money and, and additional money. It sounds like that's something is a big focus for you. I love to learn from that perspective, but yeah, to pick up on the, on the cash buyer list. I just remember Cody telling me years ago, or I've heard it on podcasts or some of the trainings, you know, go, go out there to, to network, not net sit, right? Go talk to people, get on the phone, man. Like get on the phone, call people. Who's buying? Are you buying in this area? Are you not? Who else do you know? Um, you know, obviously with COVID, but pick up the phone. I mean, most people, you know, don't be scared of the phone, you know, just cause they're big, bad cash buyers doesn't mean they're any better than you. Right. So you just have to learn to, to have conversations with people, um, add value to them and see where you might be able to help. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, growing your cash buyers list is, is you know, it, it's a plus because the more eyes you get on it, the better. I mean, we just assigned a deal this week to a guy, I think it's his first rental. Um, but I mean, we're going to make, I think like 20 over 20 something thousand on it. And he's a single guy. It's going to be his first rental. And he's still, in my opinion, he's still getting a good deal. He's yeah. still going to be able to fix it up a little bit and rent it out. So, but he's, yeah. you know, if I went to, if I was just a cash buyer employee and I went to, you know, the top guys in the market, they're going to negotiate me down to, to as low as they want to. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Guys, it's crucial. Get out there, build that cash buyers list. Um, one of them said uh, something about how do you organize? Let me see if I can find it. It's just right here. Um, how do you organize your cash buyers list? Um, for me, there's no organization and they're all just clumped together. So I don't depart them out like, oh, these buyers like 84123. These buyers like 84114. These buyers like this. No, like they're all together and they all get it. The only thing we do is we're always checking our open rate and always sorting out that because if you don't get a bunch of open rate or if you get scammed or spammed, I mean, um, that can ruin your open rate. Mm -hmm. And so if anything, there's segmenting going on where we're segmenting where it's like, man, all of these open. So let's make sure those go together. So the open rate ma maintains high because um, you don't want the ones that are never opening or mark spam to ruin the effectiveness where all of a sudden MailChimp's like, well, I'm only going to send out a few of these, but a few of these aren't going to get it. And you just don't want that to happen. So there's segmenting that goes on. But other than that, they all get lumped into one pool. Can I share a lesson that I learned this week? Again, I'm always learning. I'm fail. I just take your uh, fail forward, right? Like, so <laughs> we, we use MailerLite, not MailChimp. I couldn't use MailChimp in the beginning. I use MailerLite. Um, but anyways, I never registered my domain. I was wondering why in the world do I have 700 people not opening my mess, you know, emails. <laughs> so I, I figured I, I had to attach my domain and authenticate my domain. And now all of a sudden people are getting, getting it. So if you have a MailChimp or a, uh, it, it's better to have your own domain. I guess it helps with the spam filters or something to that effect. So that was a lesson that I learned this week. Awesome. 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 Uh, here's one that I want to share a story to answer this as well. And I, it, this is like, tis the season guys. If you don't have a big cash buyers list, you can always put it on the market. And Jerry and I just talked about this right before we hit the live button. We were talking about this. 
We found a deal for 250,000, which means nothing yet. And the ARV- wait, 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 wait. Cody, Cody, do you, you got your bell out over there somewhere? It's ready, bro. Have that ready, Have that ready. okay, I, go ahead, Cody, go ahead. It's gonna be ready, bro, it's gonna be ready. Okay, <laughs> so here we have um, a 250 home that we purchased priced. And then the ARV after repair value. Once someone fixes it up, it'd be worth three fifty. So we got a hundred thousand dollars less. So here's where it gets good, guys. We're like, hey, let's clear out the clutter, and then let's just throw it on the MLS for two ninety nine. That's it. Like, let's just do that. Let's not do a fix and flip. We didn't have the capacity right now. All of our crews are busy. We have more than we can handle on the fix and flip side. So we're like, hey, let's just open it up. So when we talk wholesale. Wholesale, finding a discounted property and retail and put them together. Wholesale. You're just going to put them on the retail market. Okay. So we put on the retail market, MLS at 299. We just got our offer submitted and signed. Get ready. $350,000. Now guys, wow. woo, will it appraise for that? Let's ring it first. Hold on. <laughs> All right. That's but insane. you could ask like, Wait a second, a hundred grand, but it's not ever going to appraise for that. It's not fixed up. You're right. It won't appraise for that. Here's the best part in the contract. We don't care what it appraises for. We'll come up with the difference. I was just like, they're going to bring the difference to the table. So if bring the difference at 315, the they're going to bring the 35 to, to, it may appraise for 300, Brian, and they're going to bring the 50 to the table. Uh, this is a dad that wants the daughter to live close by. Wow. And we had 10 offers come in like on day one. And this guy's like, I'm going to make this a no brainer for you guys so that you just pick me 350 and it won't appraise for that. Don't worry about it. I'll make up the difference. And we're just like, okay, Think done. Right. Ink it. Ink it up. Let's go. So, so, guys, so guys, did you hear this? Cody has, so it, he went on market with, so I saw a question. What, it, what, there it is. What is wholetail? So wholetail is where, Rather than assign the contract to a cash buyer, you actually close on the deal yourself. You take title now, you own it. And then what you're doing is you're going to relist it for sale back on the open market, on market, right? On the MLS. Now, now you've got the entire market looking at your deal. And what happened was, is Cody found this unique buyer, a dad who says, I want, I want my daughter close. I don't, they, they, logic is out the window. A value is out the window. They did what's called an appraisal guarantee, which I'm getting a lot of those too. Now, not 50,000 or whatever, not unlimited, but buyers want houses so bad right now that they're they're guaranteeing to pay the difference if it under appraises from the purchase price. So this guy's willing to write a check. It doesn't matter to him if it's $50,000 over appraised value, he's gonna write a check for the difference so that he can get that deal. That's how powerful it is right now, guys to get as many eyeballs as you can on your deals. That's why Cody probably could have wholesaled it for 25, 35, four. it could have still been a great wholesale. Yep. You're getting $100,000 gross. Now you're probably gonna have some commissions and closing fees and stuff, but still, what what is that gonna be? 80 grand, 85 grand net? Yeah, if, if it may be more, 89, I think it's like yeah, 87, right? 89. Yeah, you're gonna, pay, you're gonna have some carries, some commissions, some closing fees. <laughs> Who cares? You're going to make 80, 80, 90 thousand dollars net from end to end on this deal, and that is just because because why? Because Cody was willing to think outside the box. He was willing to stay in a deal a little bit longer. He still didn't touch it. There's no rehabbing going on here. It's just phenomenal, right? Take a little bit more risk because you had to fund that purchase for two fifty. Right. So raising some money, working with some funding, however you're doing that, staying in the deal, waiting to get paid a little bit longer than you normally would on a wholesale deal. But look at what happened by doing that. Phenomenal. And the guys, if you missed last week's live stream, go back and watch that. The whole episode was on wholetailing. And I shared I shared on that video and Cody, you're doing this, too. My goal is to take down every single deal I can. Like, I don't even want to do assignments. I want to do. I want to do buy it, resell it, right? Wholetail oh. as much as I possibly can because it's you're beautiful. Beautiful. Tis the season. There's no inventory, guys. There's 1,700 deals listed right now in Utah. Yeah. 1,700, guys. That's nothing. There's 1,600 no. 1, in Louisville. Um, Crazy. Well, I, think, 
I think it was 3,200 like a couple of years ago when he, this real estate agent started. There's 1,600. And it, and it doesn't matter what it costs you. I mean, last week, Cody, when we talked to, um, oh, what were their names? You remember? Was it Samantha and Brian? I can't remember. I'm mixing up my, oh, my, my oh, weeks. two partners in, in uh, John and Matt. John and Matt, yeah. Now, they paid $3,000 to borrow $35,000 for like a month or whatever. And afterwards, Cody and I did the math and we're like, dude, he paid like 36% interest on that money. <laughs> but it didn't matter. He made it 40 million. It didn't matter. Who cares, right? Yeah. Who cares? Fund your deal, take it down, relist it, and you're going to find that you're going to make so much more money in today's market. Yeah. Here's a good one, fellas. Brian, why don't we have you attack this? I know this has happened to us at some point. Maybe this has happened in the past, but what if uh, what if you can't find a buyer and don't have money to close? Well, first of all, you know, consult your local real estate attorney. You know, when you sign a contract, uh, it's a legal, you know, it's a legal agreement in place. Um, so don't, you know, talk to your attorney, but don't put a, a, a piece of uh, an agreement together if you can't close the property. Um, we do put uh, our due diligence uh, clauses in our, our contracts. Um, you know, we need time to inspect the property. I'm not a contractor. I don't know. I have no idea what stuff costs, what needs, that's why I need to bring in my people that know what they're doing. Um, you know, if you can't, you know, hopefully if you do, if you have a contract in place to get your, give yourself at least a, you know, 10, 14 day period that, uh, that you can back out. That's And that's the same verbiage, by the way, guys, when you're working with a real estate agent buying a retail home to go live in. It's the same thing. There's a due diligence period where contingent upon qualifying for a loan, contingent upon inspection, contingent upon all this stuff. And you have this great, this due diligence period, this grace period where it's like you have 10 days to let the homeowner know whether you're in or you're out. And that's that's the same thing you have in this, the same verbiage. Um, so if you don't find it and can't find a cash buyer, you just simply you just simply cancel the contract. And it's it's as simple as that. I, I don't want you guys to think too too hard on that. Um, the other one I saw was um, this one. I thought this was really good. So if I have it under contract, can I put it on the market? And that depends. Some states, you're gonna have to check with your local real estate bylaws and all your different real estate laws. Some do, some allow you. They say, oh, you have equitable interest. You have a contract and you can now market that. In Utah, you cannot market a contract until you own, you have to physically own the home to be able to market the home. Cause at that point, you're no longer marketing a home in Utah. You're marketing or a contract, you're marketing a home. And that's where they're like, nope, you're acting as a realtor. You cannot do that. So in Utah, you cannot do that. But I know there are states out there. Yes. When you put it under contract, you now have equitable interest to now market it. And uh, we, we have seen that people have been able to do that. Jerry, is there any further knowledge you want to give on that? Yeah, to add to that. So, for example, in Michigan, we are allowed to market a contract. Uh, even so, I put a clause in my contract with sellers that says um, seller gives permission to buyer to market property for rent slash sale. And I still do that because I don't want that. I don't want that seller to see my marketing. <laughs> Right. Even if I'm marketing to a cash buyer on a private list or a Facebook group or whatever, maybe I do put it up on the MLS. Um, if that comes back on me from the seller, I want them to have given me permission anyway to be able to do that. It just kind of makes it it just puts it out there that you're going to do that or maybe do that. Um, so once you verify, <laughs> like we said, once you verify that you can do that in your state, I recommend still putting in your contract that the seller gives you permission to do that. Hundred, hundred percent. But great question, guys. Hem dog. So Hem glad dog. to count Brian Hemerly. As I don't know who that man. is, man. I believe, I believe this, if I had to guess, is Bob Anthony, if I had to guess. He's on every week, Facebook user. Yep, yep, yep. Dude, Bob's awesome, man. I love Bob. I mean, I, I talk to him on a regular. He's always giving me great advice. Um, let me see if I can find some questions. Um, woo, let's see. There's hey, one. Yep, Jerry, go for yeah, it. After this one, bring up Gordon Mack there where he's asking about inspection contingencies. I'll tackle that one if we get time. Okay, let me uh, back a few. Back up. The agreement of contract deposit. It's not this one, right? 
Is it back up here, you say? Uh, yeah, it says, hey, Cody and Jerry, I'm searching for leads and most of the listings in my area do not allow for inspection contingencies. See that one? It's on 546. Hmm. 546. Okay, hold on, hold on. I'm just too high is all. Okay, 546, Gordon Mack. Hey, Cody and Jerry, I'm searching for leads, most listings. This one? Yeah, hold that okay. one up. So I'm running, into, I'm running into this quite a bit. And again, remember guys, because we're in such a low inventory market, it's hard to ask for things from, from sellers, right? The more things you ask for, the more your offer is going to get shot down. So the stronger you can make your offer by having really good terms, the better your offer is going to be. So here's what, here's how to handle that. Cause I'm making a lot of sight unseen offers. Like I haven't seen the property. Well, I don't want to waive inspection contingencies and go hard on my earnest money if I haven't even seen the property. So the way that I'm handling this is I'm just super fast. So it'll look like this. Hey, no inspection contingency. Uh, here's my offer. And I know that I've got a window of about an hour or two at least before they're going to write my offer. They're going to present it to a seller. A seller is going to sign it and get it back to me. I've got a small window anywhere from a couple hours to 24 hours. So when that happens, I immediately have my boots on the ground, get out to that property, get in that property and get eyeballs on it. And then as long as I've got eyeballs on a property and I feel good about what's going on, then I've got no problem waiving inspection. Just know that when you waive inspection, whatever earnest money you're putting down now becomes non-refundable and you're putting that at risk. So if you're okay to put that at risk, put it at risk. But I'm coming in with big earnest monies, no inspections, close fast, just so that I can try to beat out other cash offers that maybe have a five day inspection and a 30 day close and a 500 earnest money. I'll come in with a 5,000 earnest money, no inspection, close in two weeks. So that I would still with my price, like I don't jeopardize price, but I, I use the terms to strengthen my offer. So, you know, that's about the only thing you can do is just get your inspection done at the same time you're negotiating with the seller. By the way, I got an update. It was Greg Bernie. He says, I give Hemerly a shout out and y'all guess it was Anthony. I'm hurt. <laughs> <laughs> I should have picked up on that. He, he does call me him dog. So. Him dog. <laughs> All right. Here's one. Do we have to put earnest money deposit for off market deals? Jerry, a hard no. Explain. No, uh, that's an on-market thing. Agents know to ask for that, and it's very common. It's it's you are going to pay earnest money if it's on market, anywhere from five hundred to a thousand, all the way up to ten percent of of offer price. Like you just have to know that on market you're dealing with that. Off market, I don't pay it. I hardly ever pay earnest money. We did a contract today for two hundred thousand, zero earnest money, and sellers don't care. They don't even ask for it. They don't know to ask for it. So I don't, we don't even offer it. Is it true the old adage, Jerry, that to make a contract official, there's got to be uh, a signature and some kind of a, some kind of a exchange. So you're saying it doesn't need to be a money exchange. It could be a handshake exchange or what does that look like? Yeah. Now the right way to answer this guys is make sure you check your state. Real estate is governed state by state. So there may be some kind of law in your state that says there has to be consideration if that's the case, make it a dollar, make it $10, make it $100, just make it low if, if that's the case. Uh, I don't think it is. I, I do deals all over the country and I've never run into any, at least where I know of, where you have to put earnest money down to make a contract legally binding. So, you know, just, just know to manage that if it is in your state. Once I have the signed assignment contract, who do I give it to? Title. Title company. Guys. Title. Yeah. Go to your title or closing. It depends on what your state is. You either are closing like an attorney closing state or a title closing state. So that's where you'll take it. So you'll take your purchase agreement between you and the seller and then your uh, assignment agreement. <laughs> to assignment. And you're going to take both of them and take them to either your closing attorney or your title company. Yep. And uh, they're going to they're gonna tell you what you've missed or what you haven't missed. That's the beautiful thing. Don't overthink it too much. Don't think like, oh, man, I, I'm not. I had a guy not take a contract to the title company because he's like, I just don't know if I have everything. I'm like, that's the title company's job. Like, they'll tell you. They'll let you know. Like, hey, I need this before we can move along. Like, hey, I still need the authorization to check their mortgage payoff. Like, I still need this. 
get that ball moving. So once you have that assignment agreement, take it to the title company with that purchase agreement and let them start going to town on it. They're going to start doing their, their property report. They're going to start telling you what you need. There's liens or this needs to be taken care of, or this needs to be taken care of. That is someone that's like on your team. So let them help out so that you don't have to think through this. Like, what do I need? What do I need? Let them tell you what they need because they're better at it. Um, let's see. The buyer and the, um, here you go. How do you go about canceling contracts? Yeah, great, or do you have great question. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, guys, never just cancel a contract. First, renegotiate the contract. So that's, like, I don't ever just, I'm like, oh crap, I got into a bad deal, I'm out, you know, cancel. I figure out what my real numbers should be and I go back to the seller and I always I always have to have cause. Like, I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable just telling the seller, hey, I want a $10,000 price reduction just because. <laughs> that doesn't fly very well, uh, but I wanna show cause. So typically what I'll find out is there were things I didn't anticipate and it's usually one of two things. Either I underestimated repairs or I underestimated the back end value of the home. So if that happens, which it will, and it's going to, it's it still happens to me after doing this for a long time, you just go back to the seller and you say, hey, during my inspection time, it came to my attention that the repairs were more than I originally anticipated, or it doesn't look like this house is gonna sell for quite what I thought it would. That number no longer works for me, but this number does. If you're willing to amend the contract and, and lower the price, I'll continue forward with the deal. If not, then I need to terminate my contract and you know get out. So you know, think that first. Always be thinking renegotiation before termination. Um, but a simple thing that I like to do is I've got a simple termination of contract. If you guys want that, I'll give it to you for free. But title can do that for you as well. Like they'll just whip something together, send it over to the seller. It's something official in writing that says, "Hey, we're out." You know, contract closed. Um, on market, the agents will do that, obviously. But it's a pretty simple thing to do. Even with the, if you do a price reduction, you're going to need now an amendment. You're going to amend that contract to reflect the change in price. That's right. The other thing, guys, to keep in mind is keep your end game always in front of mind, front of sight when canceling a contract. So everything Jerry just said, spot on. And then now just go to all your cash buyers that said no, 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 no. Hopefully it's part of your process going forward that when you hear a no, to ask them why and at what point, at what price point does this make sense to them? At what price point is this a deal? So even though you have people interested and they're gonna be submitting offers, even the ones that say no, we are always asking why, why no? Why? Because this preps us for if we have to renegotiate, we know where our firm buyers are at what price. So we know what to renegotiate the price at. So that's crucial. Just always ask your, your end buyer. Hey, you said no on one, two, three main street, Brian, do you mind telling me what was no about it? Well, you said, I, it looks like it's gonna be like 50,000 worth of repairs and it's just not going to make sense. Awesome. At what price does this make sense, Brian? Well, I would buy it at 45,000. Awesome. Good to know. Brian's in at 45K. Call the next cash buyer. You said no on 123 Main Street and do the same thing over and over so that when you go renegotiate, you just got to renegotiate lower than what your cash buyer is going to tell you. What, and, what you and, and to add to that, Cody, ask your cash buyer, say, hey, if I can bring this to you at 45, are you prepared to take down this deal? Are you prepared to do this deal? And get their confirmation that 45 is their number now you know you can go back and renegotiate to 35 or 30 or whatever, and you've got your buyer ready to go. Love That's that. Right. Awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Hamdog, let's start with you. What are you guys currently reading? Business or for enjoyment? All right. Well, I just read for the hundredth time, and I keep going back to it over and Never over. Never split again. the difference. Yes. Hold on. And then. Guys, that's one of my favorite books. And because I'm trying to grow a team, I, I'm starting to, I, I read this once, I, I'm reading it again, and there's just so many gold nuggets in here. Um, and also to the other one about the visionary and integrator, Josh uh, and I, Josh Rocket, and I, Rocket, Rocket Fuel are gonna, are gonna read that. He, you know, we're different personalities, different skill sets, and, um, but uh, we're a solid team. We just need to figure it out now. That's awesome. Rocket fuel and traction. Phenomenal. I, I call those the business Bibles. Um, book, Jerry, what's a good book you're reading right now, bro? Uh, I'm reading it for a second time. It's The One Thing 
Ooh, Gary Keller. Yeah, amazing book. That that book as was really transformational for me because it really allowed me to to focus on the one thing that's going to have the greatest impact and that's that that's that it's kind of the 80/20 rule, right? Where you get the biggest bang for your buck. And what's interesting about that book is he says um it's not the three things, it's not the two things, it's the one thing. And so hyper focus on that one thing that's going to have the biggest impact and then go to the next one thing. Love it. Love it. Guys, I'm going to give you two. This one's called Leading an Inspired Life. It's Jim Rohn. It's a thick one, but here's why I love it. I like to have little seconds during the day, like where I can spend 10 minutes and just hurry and do like a quick, what I love about this to do something quick is each topic is about two pages, three pages long. That's it. It's not like 20 page chapters where I'm a kind of one of those guys. It's like, once I start a chapter, I have to finish it. Um, this is nice for that because I can just sit there and think about a principle like enriching your life. It's literally a page and a half is that one principle. So I can read it in three minutes and then ponder about it for seven minutes. And then it just gets my mind right for the day. So that one's good for that, for quick thoughts during the day. And then the other one is the rhythm of life. Guys, I'm reading it for the second time in three weeks. This is my, I'm telling you this book, the rhythm of life. This is by a guy by the name of Matthew Kelly. He was 24 years old at the time when he wrote this book. And I'm telling you, this guy is a spiritual giant, like just incredible of getting what's right in perspective. And the whole book is this built in like thought process of, are you becoming your best self? Is what you're doing today helping you become a better version of yourself or a lesser version of yourself? And he just trains you on, just run it through that filter. Every time we have hundreds of decisions going through our choices, options that were presented every day. So all we got to do is instead of thinking like rentals, for example, it's like bing, 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 bing. Like, is it in a nice area? Does it cash flow? Does it have good tenants? Is it a C or B class area? And then all of a sudden you spit it out and it's like, okay, I'll buy it. Or no, I'm not. Let's simplify that filter. Does the choice I'm going to make right now, does it help me become a better version of myself or a lesser version of myself? If it's a better version, move forward. If it's a lesser version, say no. And that's the beauty of this book. And again, guys, second time in like three weeks, uh, about three and a half weeks, I'm starting it for my second time because I just, I, it, it's incredible. And the, the value in it is just, is brilliant. Just bought it, Cody. Love it, man. Love it. And Action Gary Baker. Keller, one thing is fantastic. And split, the, I'm telling you, every one of these books are some of my favorite. We are students of Chris Voss, Never Split the Difference. We talk about it every single week with him, dog, on our uh, deal closing. Every single week? week? Every Tuesday. Huh? Every single week? Every other week, right? I was mirroring you. Never mind. Oh, you were mirroring me. <laughs> so yeah, guys, solid, solid stuff. Um, let's see. Um, ooh, I like seeing this. Cody, you're a flipping wholetail genius. All right, here's <laughs> wow. a good one. What KPIs do you guys track to maintain consistent results in your business? I like this question. KPIs, guys, key performance indicators. It's basically... What numbers are you looking at? What numbers are you tracking so you can stay consistent? Um, Brian, do you have any specifics or maybe one, maybe each of us attack one? Uh, this is a major, uh, an area of major focus that I haven't really focused on, just being honest, you know, over the last couple of years, I'm getting better at it. But you know, obviously, if, if you're sending out direct mail, you know, the number of phone calls, um, the number of potential leads, appointments and contracts, and of course, revenue, you know, for that. So... Um, it's always an evolving, uh, evolving task to get better at tracking that because someone who's a on the go salesperson, you know, tracking stuff like that's kind of driving me nuts. So I'm, I'm working with my VA to, to have him handle that process. It's actually inside of our podio. Uh, we use deal flow through open letter marketing and they've got some systems. So where you can, you can track your, your campaigns, uh, pretty easily now. Awesome. Uh, another one I'd add on there is to add to that. So I'm just going to throw one more out there and then Jerry throw one. Um, we love talk time. So we just adopted this guys and we love it. We literally bought six stopwatches, nothing game changing here, nothing earth shattering. Yes. A button that you do start, stop, and it tracks your time. That's what I'm talking about. That's how simple every one of our acquisition managers, every single one of our cold callers, they all have it. And once a conversation starts, they push start. And once it stops, they push stop. 
because the key ingredients, our biggest movement, our biggest driver in the business is based on how many conversations we're having with people. And so we really want to track that. And sometimes we confuse ourselves. Oh, I spent four hours, five hours, six hours. Here's what's funny. Our acquisition manager is like, I'm like, what do you think you're going to do today? He's like, probably like four or five hours talking to people. 32 minutes, guys, 32 minutes, not even close. And he was even baffled. He was like, whoa, like the time that you're on the phone with someone. So start your conversations and see how much you're doing. Are you going for the people that speak to the most people that have the most quality conversation with individuals will do the most deals. So that's one to track. Jerry? Yeah. So I kind of have a, um, I kind of have a belief and it's a rule that I live by with our team. And that is a number of offers made on a daily basis and a monthly basis. And my, my belief is that if you make a hundred offers and this is in the beginning, this is maybe you don't have very good of a network. You don't have very good closing skills. Maybe you don't even have very good leads, but if you make a hundred offers, bona fide, legit offers, meaning even in a verbal can count, but you put a number in front of a seller or an agent and offer, right? If you make a hundred offers, that will result in at least one contract, one good deal. And I think it's probably better than that. Um, and over time, hopefully you improve that and it goes from 100 to one to, you know, two, 100 to two to, or 50 to one to 25 to one, right? Um, but I tell everybody, especially if you guys are listening right now and you're working on your first deal, if you can get to a point where you're making five offers a day, that's 25 a week, that's 100 a month, you should be able to get a deal in that window of 100 offers. So then you can reverse engineer the whole thing and think, okay, well, how many conversations do I need to have? How many leads do I need to have? What does it look like now to get an offer in front of somebody? And it's just the right question is if I want five a day, now what does that need to look like in my business to get to that five a day to just get that traction going? Uh, and you wanna, make, you wanna do five offers a month? Make 500 offers, right? Five offers, 500 offers, that's a 100 to one ratio. And what'll happen is you'll start to see momentum really pick up and you'll, you'll do much better than those ratios. But it really helps, I think it really helps people visualize exactly what it takes to get this business off the ground. And you're gonna get 99 no's, but if that one yes results in a 10 or $15,000 wholesale fee, trust me, those 99 no's were well worth it to get to that one contract. So. It's just now putting in the work. So true. Here's a good one. How do you market the contract without acting as a broker? Can you put pictures of the property up online? Jerry, I'm going to have you attack this. You got ties with the real estate side too. Yeah. So I am a licensed broker. So first of all, if you want to go on the MLS, you need to be tied into a real estate agent. Now that means you can hire an agent to list it for you. They're going to want a commission. Um, you can do a flat fee service, which they charge you like 400 bucks. I do this all the time in remote markets. It's a no service thing. So no one's going to do anything for you, but it's going to get it on the MLS. You'll need to handle all communication, showings, everything, but it's really cheap to get your property on the MLS. <laughs> Just Google flat fee listing service and you'll find someone that does it. Um, you can also put it for sale by owner on Zillow and that's free. And I, I see a lot of, I know a lot of wholesalers that do that. They just put it up for sale by owner on Zillow. Again, this is, I'm assuming you take down the property, own it, and now you're trying to remarket it for sale. So those are some ways to do that. If your state allows it, you might be able to do that during the contract phase without actually owning it. Again, like we said earlier, you got to make sure you can do that in your state. But, um, you know, so if you go to a traditional full service agent, they're, they're probably going to want 3% commission. So that's expensive on the list side and pay another 3% on the buyer side. So you could be paying a total of 6%. So if that's the case, you got to budget that into your spread. You know, on Cody's deal, he's got a hundred thousand gross. So he's got plenty of room in there to pay commissions. Uh, but if you really want to save on the commission side, don't ever cut the buyer's agent. Don't cut that to two and a half or two. Leave that at three so they're motivated to, to get your deal done or to make an offer. Figure out a way to do it on, to cut costs on the list side because that's easy. Just all you want is pictures, a description, pop the thing on the MLS, and then you or your team manage the communication with buyers. Love it. Where do you guys hire your VAs? So virtual assistant, guys. 
This is not war vets. This is uh, this is virtual assistants. Although I've had that happen, uh, where people ask that literally, um, virtual assistants. Um, so, and a virtual assistant is nice because they're usually overseas. Um, it ends up being a win-win. They make great money at the hour pay, but it's also a win for us because it's a lot lower than what someone could cost. And this is really good for like the startup, the people that are like brand new solopreneurs that don't have a lot of money. Fantastic option because you don't need to bring on someone for 20, 15, 20 bucks an hour when you can find someone across the seas that you don't have to do all the taxes and work comp for and all that stuff for three, four bucks an hour. Um, so we do it through, it used to be called Odesk. Isn't it Upwork now? Is it Upwork.com? Yeah, I think, I think that's what it's called. So it used to be called Odesk back when I was managing it, but I think it since changed that name. So Upwork. Upwork I, think, I think there's five or two. And then um, ask other real estate uh, investors too. Hey, do you happen to know of a VA? Because if they have a solid VA, hey, do they happen to have any other family members or anybody else that may be looking for work? Because yeah. usually I've found, I've had a rock star VA for the last eight months. Um, and his wife is a VA too. And I actually yeah. referred his wife to, to another investor. So that's a, that's a good way to do it. Um, and then, um, you know, if you're in the real estate game and you're posting, I'm not sure, you know, Facebook, whatever, I, we get a lot of virtual, you know, people asking us, hey, do you need a virtual assistant? So the more active you are, you could, you could potentially bring, uh, you know, find somebody that way. Yeah. So a couple of tips, a couple of tips I'll give on VAs. Um, not all VAs are created equally. Uh, so for example, the VAs from India, they're, they're really good. They're highly intelligent. They can do a lot of things, but you don't want to put them on the phones. So we don't put, we don't put VAs from India on the phones. The accent just is a deterrent for people, right? So, uh, the best VAs for the phones we found are the Philippines. You can, you could hardly tell there's an accent, at least with the VAs we use. They're from the Philippines and their their English is phenomenal. Like I'm, I'm amazed at how good their English is. And so you're gonna pay a little bit more for VAs that can get on the phones versus the, the non-phone VAs. And I agree, I agree with everything you just said. Um, most of our VAs are referrals from the VAs we really like. So when we find a rockstar VA, we ask them, hey, um, who do you recommend? We're looking for another VA. And they'll usually bring somebody that's a rock star like them. And, and they kind of know, hey, my, my neck's on the line if I refer someone that's no good. So they tend to bring, bring referrals that are just really good people that do a great job. Uh, the one thing that we do with all our VAs is we'll do the task ourselves and we'll time it. And then we'll give that to the VA. We do a screen share. So we do where you capture your computer and then we, we outline, you know, on the screen while you're talking, I use, uh, I show you, I show you, it's a, it's a Apple product. I think it's like 50 bucks. There's free stuff too, but we'll just record the screen, explain what we want done and then give that link, you know, drop that in Dropbox or Google drive or something. And we'll give that to the VA. And we'll say, watch this video and do it exactly like that. And then when they perform the task, we track how long it took them. And if they're, as long as they're within how long it took me to do it, I'm good. Brilliant. Three times as long, then they're, you know, the question is, is it you or me, right? Did I, is it me? Did I not explain myself? Or is it you? You're not getting it. What is it? <laughs> and usually it's me. Like I just didn't do a good job explaining what I wanted done. And, you know, I got to go back and kind of explain it better. But those are just a couple quick tips on VAs. Guys, here's a good one. I love everyone on this panel's uh, opinion on this one. Um, this I'm going to share by a story. So my own personal story. So it may resonate and it may not resonate. And I think everyone's going to have a, a good opinion and value on this. So I got into insurance 2010 selling insurance, home and auto insurance. I thought I was going to set the world on fire, by the way, one policy at a time. And I got into it. And my first year I made $19,000 and I had two kids at the time, a mortgage payment. Uh, me and my wife were just trying to keep our head above water and it was not enough money, by the way. 19K was just not enough money to feed two kids and, and a mortgage payment. And me and my wife, many nights would just eat the leftovers. <laughs> um, but I'll tell you, five years later, I came home to seeing my wife crying, right? And I've told this story before on here. And it was, it was so hard for me because I'm like, I'm the provider and we still don't have enough money coming in. It wasn't a lack of drive. It wasn't a lack of energy. It wasn't a lack of work ethic. I was busting my tail off. Like I was going like crazy. 
I just wasn't taking the right action to blow up the insurance business. I was taking action, just not the right action. And so when I went to the Real Estate Investor Association, that other, that was like two nights after this occurrence where I saw my wife crying. And I will tell you guys, I went with a new set of ears. And from that moment on, I'm like, I got to figure something else out. This isn't going to work. And so I heard wholesaling and I'd heard it for five years, but I finally was listening from my ears of like, I want to do this. I want to change my life. So I, here's the difference. I wanted to find someone and do it right this time. I had all of the drive. I'm willing to take any action. You tell me to pluck hair off Jerry's beautiful beard and I will pluck hair off his beard. Like I will do whatever it takes <laughs> to do a wholesale deal but I didn't know the right action. So I knew if what little money I had, which was nothing, I had to put it on a credit card, by the way, I invested into a mentor that I liked, respected, trusted, and like synced up with, with like morals and values as well. So I knew that with the little money I had, at least I knew with confidence, I'm going to be spending that on marketing with confidence because I'm just going to follow step-by-step step this proven step-by-step -step instruction to go out and do my first deal. And that's what I needed. I had very little money. And so I couldn't afford to just go figure out and see if it's going to work on my own. I had to, like, I want to make sure every dollar invested was going to be spent well. And because of it, guys, 39 days later, I did my first deal for $24,000 and that changed everything. There's no way on my own I would have done a deal in 39 days. In fact, I question if I could have done it in six months because I think I always would have had this not lack of drive, not lack of confidence, but, or I should say not lack of drive, but maybe a lack of confidence. I'd have been like, oh, like I would have been holding back. Like as I put that hundred dollars down into marketing or $50, I would have been held back. But I knew, hey, I like this guy. I trust this guy. I've seen that he's done deals. I'm going to follow it step by step. And this gave me confidence. And that's what turned into the 39 days making 24,000. And that changed everything. Time kills all deals, but time kills all investors too. The longer you go without a deal, you start to tell yourself, maybe, maybe God doesn't want me to have money. Maybe, uh, maybe I'm not meant for this. Maybe I'm supposed to just be grateful for where I'm at making this much money. Maybe I'm supposed to just be grateful for how my life is. Guys, that's, 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 all, that's all a lie. You guys can do this. Every one of you can do this. I'm living proof that you can do this. Jerry's living proof you can do this. Brian's living proof you can do this. But yes, for me, I'm always telling people, absolutely. If you know you're going to jump all in, you're going to do it step by step, find a mentor you love, like, trust, respect, and go with confidence on every action you're taking so you can go get your deal quicker. Yeah, I want to add to that, Cody, because... Um... You know, for me, when I first got started, Cody, I wish I had your foresighted vision. I didn't. I thought I had to figure it all out on my own. So I didn't I didn't invest in any kind of advanced coaching or mentoring for a couple of years, I think maybe two years. And then I finally, you know, saw the value in it, invested in some good coaching and mentoring. Clearly, I 10x my results from that. And then I look back and today, looking back, I give my right arm to have got coaching and mentoring sooner because I looked at all of the mistakes that I could have avoided. I looked at the growth I could have had, had I not been so stubborn into thinking that I had to figure everything out on my own. Um, now there's a place for figuring stuff out on your own. Even, a, even the best coach and mentor in the world isn't gonna do it for you. You've gotta, you've gotta take action, know. right? Um, but I'll tell you a quick story that I had, a couple, that happened to me a couple years ago. Um, in my marketing business, um, there was this guy that, to me, he, he had things and he knew things that I just didn't know. And I knew that I could figure out, but that it would take me a year to 18 months to figure it out on my own. So I approached this person and I said, hey, what would it look like for you to spend a full day with me and show me, answer my questions, show me exactly how you do what you do? And he lived in Hawaii. I'm, I'm this, I was living in Utah at the time. And, uh, and he said to me, he said, wire me $25,000, get on a plane, come out here to Hawaii. I'll block out between nine o'clock and four o'clock. I'll tell you anything you want to know. Done. Did it. I didn't even think about it. I wired $25,000, flew to Hawaii, spent a day. I had a tape recorder, notes. I even brought someone from my team to come and like also take notes. And I literally 
from now I had to take action, but I literally think that the results from that, I think probably today, a million dollars profit to me from the things that I learned from that one day, just with that person, because the things he showed me, I was ready for, I knew I could do, I was ready to implement. And I, it, he could have told me 50,000, he could have told me 100,000, I'd have wrote the check. Why? Because if I want to get to a place where I'm not at, and I know somebody's at that place, I will pay them whatever it costs me because I'll 10 X because I know how to implement. I know how to take action. And if you know how to take action, you just need now the right mentorship and you can get there 10 times faster than you ever will on your own. And that's just my mindset about it now. hundred percent. Brian. Yeah. So I, I grew up playing sports my whole life. And, uh, so I've been around a lot of, a lot of good coaches, uh, played college football, played a pretty high level, uh, in the big 10. And, and, and I just remember one of my coaches saying, my job is to take you where you can't take yourself. And that's, that's getting around the right people and the right coaches. I, I will say, you know, the question is, is coaching worth investing in your first 90 days? It, it isn't. If you're not going to take action, if you're going to take action and you're going to listen to the coach and what they're teaching you to do in the steps, absolutely. It's worth it not worth it if you're if you're lazy and you decide, you decide to pay some money and, and don't do anything and unfortunately you see unfortunately you see some people that that do that but um yeah it's just getting around the, the right coaches and taking the right action and implementing those and don't worry about about failing i think a lot of people they're so concerned about oh i'm gonna fail you know, get right back up and, and keep mm -hmm. going yeah Love it. look yeah. at this so much value guys I feel like we're getting good questions. I feel like we've given it good time. How do you feel about on time of this, Jerry? You think we do one more question? Yeah, let's do it. Let's wrap up, answer another question. You got a good one there? Um, let's see. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Um, hmm. I wish we could get to more questions too. There's so many good questions. So many good ones, so many good ones. Um, Here's one out of a help, Jerry. I think this is going to be good out of a help. So not so much as a question. What is a great email where this individual can reach out to you because he is 15 years old and wants to be your bird dog in Tucson? Oh, yeah, yeah. So just go to support at flippingmastery.com and uh, just put in your email that, that you were on the live stream with Jerry and Cody and you want a bird dog in Tucson and they'll, they'll make sure that gets to me. Awesome. 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 Guys, any last words? Let's do one round robin, one piece of advice. So let's look at this from an angle of today was all about being creative um, and wholesaling. What is one piece of advice that you guys would give in closing remarks to help each and every one of uh, the audience to get out there and start doing deals more consistently? Who wants to start this one? I will. Okay, let's go, Jer. So biggest biggest piece of advice I think I could give around this idea is uh, from what I've observed in my own life, my own business with real estate, uh, with people like Cody, people that play at a high level, Brian working there, is the people that are the most successful are the ones that adapt the fastest to market changes. And what I mean by that is as you get involved in your market, the markets are going to change. Opportunities are going to come. Doors are going to open. Doors are going to close. And the faster you can adapt to whatever the market's giving you, those are the people that are ultimately the most successful because it's that adaptation that puts you, um, you know, first to market, right? The first implementers, the ones that can see it, put it in practice, do it, are the ones that actually capture market faster than anybody else. And so... Don't ever lock yourself in. Don't ever, I said this earlier, don't ever put blinders on where you're unable to see all the different opportunities that are around you. You've got to be able to, to see and recognize and embrace that it's constantly gonna evolve, it's constantly gonna change, and you're gonna thrive in that environment. You want that environment because you know that if you can adapt quickly, you can be first to market and you can really see these huge, these huge margins. Like, Cody wholetailing that deal for $100,000. Uh, that came because Cody was willing to, to see low inventory, 
feel and know that if he puts that property on market, he's going to have a lot of eyeballs. He's going to have a buyer that's going to way overpay for it. And so he's, he's seeing those opportunities and willing to adapt to low inventory in a market. Now, when that changes, Cody's going to adapt again. When that changes, I'm going to adapt again. It's fine. I look forward to it. I hope it changes because I know I'll be the first one to change with it. Yeah. Right. So I just, I want you guys to kind of really adapt that mindset. Change is good. You want to be able to be first to market, see that change and capitalize on it. Love it. Hem dog. I got to follow that, follow that uh, from Jerry, huh? <laughs> That's kind of hard to do. Now I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go just a little bit different. I, I think uh, a, a lot of it uh, starts with with your mindset, and I always think about like limiting beliefs. And I think a lot of people who are maybe new or be like, uh, you know, scared or timid, um, and, and that's because we, we're, we all have these limiting beliefs in our lives, and unfortunately, it's it's come up through your through your time in your life, whatever your situation, your culture, whatever. And and and, and stop stop and think about is that who I really want to be, who, who I was in the past? You can change yourself today from tomorrow you can change yourself absolutely surround yourself with positive people get in the right peer groups of people that are at the destination where you want to be and surround yourself with those people be positive and try to push out the negative as much as you can i'm telling your mindset is number one i guarantee if you interview all the top real estate investors and obviously you two are, are very successful i guarantee you guys are all about making yourselves better better people so you can be better leaders for your organizations and uh and so forth so that's what i would say is you know focus on making yourself better so you can help others around you love it well you just took mine so how do i follow oh. you all right so i'm gonna break this down to what i call three p's ppp and this is purpose what is the purpose you're going to be doing this keep that front of sight front of mind right now if it is to make more money okay that was my initial thing too. I came home to a wife that was crying and maybe your initial purpose is, hey, I need to make more money. I get it. There's nothing wrong about that. And you'll see some shifts in time when you make more money. And so whatever it is, your purpose, many people come to me when they're asking me like, hey, how do I get into this game or how do I do this? And many of my students will always tell me the purpose is to make more money, to have more time. That's the second one is Purpose is make more money and time. They need more time with their family, go on vacations, be able to do things they've never been able to do before because their W-2s held them back. Just keep front sight of that. Um, this job, if left in a solopreneur wearing all the hats, can tire you out and get you back to that W-2 to a comfortable job because all you did is now acquire a higher paying job, but you had to sacrifice more for that. You had to give up more time. You're now not going on vacation. You're now not hanging out with your family. You are making more money. So just remember, what is your purpose? What is your absolute purpose? And stay true to that. So that's the first one. The second one is process. Whenever you can, put a process in place. Follow that process step by step. Whether mailing goes out on Tuesday, so it lands on Thursday. Uh, whatever that is, you follow this process step by step so that when you plug in the third P, which is people, that they can succeed at such a high level. So purpose, process, and people. If you can get the right purpose why you're in this business, Get the right process in place and surround yourself with the right people. Um, you will win at a very, very high level. So that's about it. Jerry, what's your tagline? If you like today's show, what did you want him to do? Leave a comment and say, Cody, Brian, Jerry, you are flipping geniuses. I love that one. I can't even use it. I feel guilty if I say it on this show. It's like, no, this is Jerry's thing, but I freaking love that. Flipping geniuses, guys. <laughs> awesome. Uh, closing notes, Jerry, what do they need to do? This is going to now die the live feed, but it's going to be really activated on the YouTube channel. So take your comments. If your question didn't get asked here, please take your comments and now put them below the video because yeah. this live feed, once it ends, so do these live questions. So bring them over in the comment section under the video and leave your questions so that we can answer them during the week and we'll do the best we can to do that until our next week. Now, there could be a no week with you, right? I mean, we're how close are we to a number we're 10? Close. Yeah, so it. So you guys that don't know, we're expecting baby number 10. Yeah, you heard that, 10. Brian Hammerly just got floored right there. Did you see that? He's like, <laughs> Are you serious? Wow, that's phenomenal. Hey, you want to hear something funny, Cody? So my wife found these goals I wrote back in 2009. <laughs> and uh, one of the goals was have 10 kids. I wrote what? it down as a goal. 
Who would write that down as a goal? I don't know. Anyone that <laughs> – were you drinking during the time? <laughs> yeah, so we're due any day now, so so I may not be with you guys uh, next, next Tuesday's live stream. We'll see. Guys, look how many of these great comments – We've got flipping geniuses. We've got it going. Flipping genius, flipping geniuses. So guys, regardless, I'll be on here next week where we're going to break down another case study. And uh, congrats, Jerry. Look at this one. Congrats, Jerry. We're done at eight. Wow. <laughs> Come on. That's not a get to a, get to the double digit, baby. You're close. Rookie. No skin. I'm at four, guys. Four, no more. That was meant for me. That was... Uh, I think Heavenly Father's like, let's give Cody all the spirited ones and four is <laughs> enough. It's a, it's enough for me. All right, guys. You guys rock. Thank you so much. Again, carry your comments over below the video now so that we can help you out. And uh, you guys are rock stars. Brian, thank you so much for being on here. I know that was your 830, your time. Um, thank you so much for being on here, my friend. Uh, we honor. appreciate thank the you value guys. and doing that case study. This is going to help a lot of people get out of their way and get unstuck. So thank you. For sure. Anybody wants to reach out to me, I'm in Louisville. Uh, we're buying deals too. So if you're wholesaling this market, reach out to me on Facebook. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Jerry. All right. We'll see you guys next time. See ya. See ya.